Last year, Inside Climate News revealed that as early as 1977, a top Exxon scientist projected with impressive accuracy that by 2010, there'd be 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere and, quote, noticeable temperature changes. By 1981, Exxon scientists and researchers concluded that rising CO2 levels could create catastrophic impacts within the first half of the 21st century. They foresaw that the fossil fuel industry might have to leave 80% of its recoverable reserves in the ground. By, by the early 1980s, the industry's largest oil companies and its powerhouse lobbyists, the American Petroleum Institute, were also well aware of the research. It included the potential area for R&D to, quote, investigate the market penetration requirements of introducing a new energy source into worldwide use, in other words, renewable energy. By 1989, Exxon pivoted. With the American Petroleum Institute, it spearheaded catastrophically successful disinformation campaigns to cast doubt on its own climate science and throttle regulation of greenhouse gases. That denial is finally vaporizing, but as Mackenzie Funk wrote, one form of climate denial remains almost wholly uncorrected, Exxon's stock price. Led by New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, about 17 state attorneys general and nine envir environmental groups have subpoenaed millions of documents to ascertain if Exxon lied to its shareholders by hiding the likely impact of climate change on its business. Having to leave 80% of the oil in the ground would constitute stranded assets that will radically shrink the company's valuation. Said Schneiderman, there may be massive securities fraud here. Last April, Exxon struck back hard. It's refusing to turn over documents and suing several of the attorneys general. It's mobilizing Congress to investigate the investigators, including the public servants and NGO leaders such as 350.org and Greenpeace. The oil-backed group America Rising Squared is deploying vicious social media campaigns and trackers with video cameras to stalk activists, including Bill McKibben, who will be with us tomorrow. Exxon's defense is that the litigation, quote, violates ExxonMobil's constitutionally protected rights of freedom of speech, freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, and due process of law. Yes, this is what corporate personhood means in practical terms. As Albert Einstein said, the world will not evolve past its current state of crisis by using the same thinking that created the situation. That's why Tom Lindsay and Marty Margill are occupying the law. These legal visionaries are challenging corporate constitutional rights while creating new legal frameworks nationally, locally, and globally to bring about genuine democracy and protection of the natural world. They build on the late Richard Grossman's pathfinding work challenging the legal fiction of corporate personhood. Tom and Mari work through the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, where they assist communities to design laws, ordinances, and community bills of rights that elevate community decision-making over corporate rights. They're also working with communities and governments to embed legal rights of nature, such as its historic inclusion in the Ecuadorian Constitution. Tom Lindsay co-founded CELDF in 1995 and serves as its executive director and chief legal counsel. He also co-founded its groundbreaking Democracy Schools in 2003, which I've done several times and highly recommend. They teach communities how to challenge the legal system at its core. He's the co-author with Annika Campbell of Be the Change, How to Get What You Want in Your Community, and their new book, We the People, Stories from the Community Rights Movement in the United States. Mari is the Associate Director of CELDF and directs its international programs. She's worked with great success to advance rights of nature in Nepal, India, Australia, and Ecuador. Their work is the subject of a powerful new film, We the People 2.0, that will screen here this weekend, directed by our old friend Lila Connors, who did uh, DiCaprio's 11th Hour movie. Please join me in welcoming these courageous defenders of democracy and Mother Earth, Tom Lindsay and Mari Margill. <laughs> Kenny, thank you for that introduction.
And a uh, big thanks for all that you, Nina, and the staff do year in and year out to make this conference possible. Hello, Bioneers. So it's been several years since we appeared on this stage to talk about how people in cities, towns, villages, and counties across the United States were beginning to do a new kind of environmental organizing. To leverage their local governments to seize power away from the corporations that increasingly run our lives and to return that power to their own communities. Since we appeared on this stage, of course, the state of the world has only gotten worse. Today, there are more oil and gas pipelines, more toxic waste dumps, more factory farms, more GMOs, more frack wells, more corporate assaults on our communities and the planet than ever before. Half of all animal and plant species have been driven to extinction. Coral reefs are dying, the oceans are acidifying, and even the most dismal predictions of climate scientists are turning out to be downright optimistic. So much so that many now believe that we've entered a new age, the Anthropocene, in recognition of man's impact on this planet. As the band R.E.M. sings, it's the end of the world as we know it, but here on Earth, things definitely do not feel fine. By all rights, we shouldn't even be at this place. It's not like we haven't been trying hard enough to protect the planet. We've created thousands of groups, written thousands of books, held thousands of conferences, teachings, and trainings, sued over thousands of corporate projects, marched down thousands of city streets. Yet, somehow, our collective efforts just haven't added up. So the critical questions we should be asking are, what aren't we doing? And why aren't we doing it? Is it possible that we've misunderstood the very nature of the problem that we face? That we've mistakenly believed that the transformation that is so desperately needed can be achieved by working within the boundaries of the current system of law and governance? The very system that got us here in the first place? without changing the source code under which it operates? Could it be that we've mistakenly believed that a system premised on legal rights for corporations and the treatment of nature as property could ever have the flexibility to transition to a different system? Maybe instead, we should take an old Ethiopian proverb to heart. Fish are often the last to discover the water in which they swim. Historian Richard Grossman, who graced this very Bioneer stage over a decade ago, often remarked that we live under a 1780s system of law and government, a system that was designed to provide the highest constitutional protections to economic, commerce, and property. The Founding Fathers couldn't have conceived of water pollution caused by fracking for natural gas, landslides and habitat loss from deforestation, or sea levels rising from climate change. Conversation about environmental limits would have been alien to them in the face of this nation's seemingly endless bounty of natural resources. More importantly, the founders were men of their age, believing that political liberty was directly dependent on their ability to convert those natural resources into products of commerce, on the conversion of forests into lumber, mountains into quarries, meadows into farm fields. They believed that their freedom and liberty were directly dependent on that commercial production, directly dependent on the endless, production of more, the endless production of more everything. And so, not surprisingly, they designed a plan of governance 
This country's source code, our constitutional DNA, that sought to not only shield that commercial production from interference, but to insulate those engaged in that production from majority lawmaking by we, the people. It is why they wrote a right to engage in commerce directly into the text of the Constitution, creating federal power capable of overriding any local or state law that interferes with that commerce. It is that constitutional DNA that logically treats nature as property. Because if nature had rights, it would no longer simply be a resource to be sacrificed to the endless production of more stuff. It is that constitutional DNA that logically treats the people of our cities and towns as only having the power to make law that state legislatures choose to give them. Because if we had independent community power to decide what actually happens where we live, our municipalities could no longer be held hostage to corporate extraction and development. And it is because of that constitutional DNA that when we take on some of the largest corporations in the world, we don't run into those corporations first. Rather, we run into our own system of law first. And that system, far from being neutral, is about providing a structural advantage which elevates the rights of those doing the production above the rights of people, our communities, and nature. In many ways, our constitutional DNA allowed to evolve to its logical conclusion is nothing more than a suicide pact for our communities and for our planet. So how does all of this play out in real life? In November 2014, when the people of Denton, Texas voted in a landslide to ban fracking, it took less than 24 hours for the oil and gas industry and their own state government to file suit to nullify their ban. Perhaps even worse, their own elected representatives in the state legislature then passed House Bill 40, banning Texas communities from banning fracking. But wait. When the people of Lafayette, Longmont, and Fort Collins, Colorado voted to ban and regulate fracking, they were sued, not only by the oil and gas industry, but also by their own governor. The Colorado Supreme Court eventually declared that the state has the legal authority to prohibit people in their own municipalities from banning oil and gas extraction. But wait. When the people of Pennsylvania's rural communities banned factory farming and toxic sludge dumping, the state legislature not only preempted the authority of communities to pass those laws, it also placed the state attorney general's office on call to serve as a private lawyer for corporations affected by those local laws. So to be clear, they authorized the state's lawyer to sue communities on behalf of corporations to overturn those local laws. When the people of Jackson County, Oregon banned GMOs in 2014, the state legislature passed a bill that preempted all other Oregon communities from regulating or banning GMO seeds. In Hawaii, federal courts have now declared that the state has the legal authority to ban its own communities from banning GMOs. And when the people of Mora County, New Mexico, adopted a law banning all hydrocarbon extraction, Mora was sued twice in federal court by the oil and gas industry, with the lawsuit seeking millions of dollars from the people of Mora to pay the corporations for the value of the oil and gas they lost as a result of their law. 
From the vantage point of this country's constitutional DNA, not only are these outcomes possible, they are utterly predictable. The results are mandated by the system of law. It's not that the system is broken. It's that the system is working perfectly. Given this constitutional design, it's no wonder our activism has been stuck in the politics of influence, trying to pressure this or that corporation to do the right thing or get an important person to champion this or that cause. Most of us still believe that what matters most is who we elect, even though whomever we elect are still imprisoned by our constitutional DNA. We do that work because under this structure, we simply don't have the power to do anything else. But that's all starting to change. Over a decade ago, people in mostly rural communities across the United States began talking about the need to change the system under which they lived. Some were longtime activists, tired of running on the hamster wheel of conventional environmentalism. Most of them, however, were first-time activists fighting for their own communities who refused to set foot on the hamster wheel in the first place. Supported by our weekend democracy schools, they began to learn the mechanics of this system, how it works, and more importantly, why it works that way. At democracy school, they examined prior people's movements who were also stuck on the outside of the Constitution looking in. That includes the abolitionists who, instead of working towards better conditions of slavery or a slave protection agency, understood the necessity of changing the existing system's source code, the constitutional DNA. The abolitionists even burned copies of the US Constitution. They burned the Constitution Understanding that it wasn't the actions of individual slave owners that were the problem, but the constitutional DNA which enabled and protected a system of slavery. The communities we began to work with also envisioned a new system of law, one in which communities have more rights than corporations, and one in which nature and ecosystems have enforceable rights of their own. And instead of just dreaming about that system, in the face of overwhelming corporate and state opposition, they actually began to build it. They began to take over their own municipal governments, to pass local laws known as community bills of rights. Those bills of rights recognize a right of local community self-government and then assert that power to create legally binding rights to clean air and water and rights to sustainability. Understanding that we cannot protect the earth without recognizing the highest protections for the environment itself, those local bills of rights are the first in the nation, indeed the world, to recognize legally binding rights of nature. Through those laws, they banned specific corporate activities like water privatization and fracking as a violation of those local bills of rights. And understanding that those bans would be challenged, both in court and by state governments, the laws then directly contest the constitutional DNA. First, they openly nullify corporate constitutional rights. And they directly challenge the authority of other governments to interfere with their community rights and the rights of nature. Communities understand. They understand that this activism is civil disobedience of a different and collective kind. Further, they understand that their local laws may still be overturned by the courts or by their state government. 
And in response, some communities are now beginning to legalize civil disobedience. They're prohibiting police from arresting community members who seek to enforce their laws through direct action. This work has become known as the Community Rights Movement. Of course, the people who run this country's largest agribusiness, energy and waste corporations, haven't just sat back and applauded this outbreak of democracy. <laughs> Rather, they've decided to tighten the screws, filing more and more lawsuits against communities, using state legislatures to adopt more laws preempting communities from doing almost anything and now even threatening to criminally prosecute local elected officials who dare to adopt these laws. Unlike before, however, these communities are forcing corporations and their allies to fight under a new script, one written by the communities themselves to specifically call out the very authority of corporations and state governments to override them. In so doing, they are pitting the ostensibly core values of this system the consent of the governed and majority rules against the system that actually exists. In many ways, they are forcing the system to attack itself. Our communities are arguing that they have a fundamental right of local community self-government, the right to local democracy that can be used to expand civil, political, and environmental rights in ways that corporations and state governments are legally unable to override. In short, they are creating an environment in which more and more people are able to see in real time that the system in which we live is not a democracy. <clears throat> in which more and more people begin to understand that democracy and sustainability are intertwined, that without one you cannot have the other. Because otherwise we are at the mercy of interests who can legally override a community's vision of the future with one of their own. It is that growing body of people who have now joined together community by community in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, to create statewide organizations known as community rights networks, to draft and propose changes to their state constitutions which would recognize the authority of communities to veto corporate projects, redefine corporate rights, and recognize the rights of nature. In addition to mobilizing across the United States, people are also beginning to do this work abroad. Today, in places like Nepal, environmental groups and indigenous peoples are beginning to recognize that conventional environmental laws, like legalized oil drilling and coal burning, are never going to stop the Himalayan glaciers from melting and never going to stop climate change. They're advancing a right to climate constitutional amendment, which recognizes that people in nature possess a right to a healthy climate and that the climate itself has a right to be healthy and free from human-caused global warming pollution. And closer to home, just last month, the General Council of the Ho-Chunk Nation in Wisconsin voted to recognize the rights of nature in their tribal constitution. They are the first, but likely not the last, to do so. It may be true, as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. What is equally true, however, is that most of the time, we have to forcibly bend it with our very own hands. Above all, we need to stop pretending 
that we can create the world that needs to be by working around the edges of the system of law that is. As Joanna Macy once said on this stage, we can choose to either be hospice workers, helping to ease the passing of the planet, or we can be midwives, helping to birth a completely new system. The people in the community rights movement have already made their choice. It's time to join them. Thank you. <laughs>